Um, so, so the question I vex people like me and continues is, how does something that started out so inspiring um, end up uh, as really a, an inspiring example of civil disobedience, peaceful democratic change, turn into such a complete disaster, uh, which it has become uh, since then? I, I don't know how well you can see this. Can you see what these guys have on their heads? He's wearing a strain on his head, like the thing you'd, you'd strain your spaghetti in, um, the, these two guys here. And um, this is in December 2013 when it was still, there was still something comical and fun and festive about, about this. Uh, things obviously got much more serious in January 2014. That's uh, sort of across the street from where those other pictures were taken after, the, uh, after the, the forces of the government had tried to clear the square. And of course, in February of 2014, almost exactly a year ago, snipers um, shooting protesters. Um, well, the, to get back to the question of how did things, something that started so inspiring um, um, turn out so badly, a big part of the answer is that Vladimir Putin um, did know what he wanted, um, and he knew how to get it. Um, and, and that's been quite clear in the recent months. Um, but if we ask the big picture, what's, what's happening in Ukraine and why, I think that if we just focus on, on Putin the bad guy, and there's plenty to be said about that, we're missing um, a lot of, of the picture. Uh, what's going on in Ukraine and what happened going all the way back to those, those protests in December 2013, I'm going to argue, um, is part of a much broader trend, uh, not only in that country, uh, but in that region and actually throughout the world, uh, which is uh, the problem of how to build legitimate authority. The, the problem that kicked all of this off is that people just did not feel that the government of Ukraine um, had any right to rule. And so they talked about it. Um, and once a lot of people felt that, they, that that government didn't have a right to rule, it was very easy to topple. The problem was, once it was broken and that government was toppled, trying to again create a powerful governing authority that could run the country and push back against external aggression um, was very, very difficult to do. So that's my overarching argument, is that this is really a problem about, uh, about building legitimate authority. Um, so the war has many antecedents, many potential consequences, I'm not gonna talk about all the dimensions of the conflict. I'll leave plenty of time for questions and I'll be happy to address those. But again, so what I wanna do is to put Ukraine's, um, um, to put the revolution and the war into this broader global perspective. So I'll talk first about the problem of legitimacy, then talk more specifically about Ukraine and Russia, and, and then uh, try to conclude with some questions that frankly I don't have answers for. Um, but maybe you do. Um, so let me talk about legitimacy. Um, and, and in that sense, I, I sent a couple of papers forward, which some of you have, have maybe read. This talk, in a lot of respects, is a synthesis of, of three papers I've written over the last 18 months or so um, having to do with this situation. The first of them uh, focused on how, as democracy spread in the post-Cold War era to Europe, Asia, Latin America, and so on, um, a lot of leaders in a lot of parts of the world figured out fairly quickly how to gain the legitimating effects of democracy, that is, the parts of democracy that say, I was elected, therefore I have the right to rule, something we take for granted in this country, um, to gain those legitimating effects without the accountability effects. Right? So I won the election, I get to rule, and now I get to rule any way I want. Um, and to make sure that once you've won an election, the next election is not so uh, competitive that you have to wonder if you're gonna lose it. Um, so lots of rigged elections, lots of use of, of government uh, money to support uh, one's political allies, lots of use of political authority to punish one's political enemies, and so on and so forth. Um, and what's been fascinating to me is how those tactics have spread around the world. Um, you can sort of see things like uh, constitutional referenda to give more power to the president. Uh, I think the first post-Soviet example was in um, Kazakhstan in the early 90s, and, and by uh, the early 2000s, you see Hugo Chavez doing the same thing in Venezuela. Um, so while there's been a lot of talk about um, the diffusion of democracy and the diffusion of uh, certain pro uh, protest tactics in a direction of democracy, there's been less focus on the diffusion of these tactics of, of authoritarianism. And that's really what that first uh, paper um, was based on, was, was arguing. Um, not only are those tactics uh, spreading around the world, but they're redefining what democracy means. Um, and, and in a way, the United States and Western Europe has contributed this by focusing very much on the role of elections above all as, as defining democracy. And a lot of people have taken advantage of that, right? We've got elections, we've got a democracy, how can you complain? When in fact, right, most of us would argue that democracy is a lot more than that. 
Russia, of course, has been one of the leaders in that effort, but there, there have been a lot of other countries uh, doing the same thing. And in a lot of ways, they've been supporting one another to say, you want democracy, you got democracy, stop complaining. Um, and Ukraine has been one of the main battlegrounds in that contest, going all the way back up to the early 1990s. And so in that sense, there is uh, an ideological dimension to this, uh, to this conflict. It's not the old Cold War communism versus capitalism sort of stuff, but it is uh, about uh, the ability of the West uh, to determine what democracy is and means and, and therefore hold up a standard that everybody else has to uh, conform to. So the second paper, uh, and, and the one I'm gonna talk about now, the one you don't have, um, looks more specifically at Ukraine and what's happened there since November 2013. And it asks the question, how is it that a government that in 2010, not very long ago, was elected in the freest, fairest election that Ukraine has ever had, um, and really in one of the freest, fair elections in that whole region uh, in the post-Soviet era, how that government by 2014 had no legitimacy whatsoever, um, at, least, at least in Kiev where it mattered, um, and really not much in most of the rest of the country as well. How a group of protesters, um, with you know going back to the previous picture with strainers on their heads, um, that assembled quite spontaneously in November and December of 2013. Uh, by January, February of 2014, uh, got the entire citizenry of Kiev, the city of two million people, and by extension the rest of the citizens of Ukraine of 48, 49 million people, to say, those guys that we elected three years ago are not the people we're gonna listen to. We don't consider them legitimate. We're gonna listen to you guys, right? Um, out there on the streets of Kiev making speeches on, on the stage. How did that happen? Um, the, uh, and again, if you were inside the barricades in that period, let me go forward a little bit here. Um, actually, let me go backward, right? If you're inside the barricades in this area, there was total work, okay? Um, there were shops, high end. This was a, an area of Ukraine that's sort of like the National Mall in Washington and Times Square in New York rolled into one. It's the public space but it's also the highest end shopping in the country. No broken windows, um, no stolen merchandise, no looted stores. If you wanted to go in and buy a $400 shirt, you could do it right in the middle of the, provos, uh, the protests. Um, the electricity was on, the metro was running, so it was easy to get to the protest and get home again on time. Um, supplies were coming in, trash was going out, porta potties were being empty every night gigantic trucks coming in and out. This was very well organized. In other words, the government inside this protest zone was effective and efficient, both of which are actually miraculous in Ukraine. Um, but it wasn't by the actual government. Um, and it was because they were not only were these folks well organized, but they had the total cooperation of, of the governed, the people inside that zone. Nobody was trying to do anything they shouldn't have done. Which is also very unusual in Ukraine, which is notorious for its corruption. Um, so that's, that's puzzling and it, and it helps explain what happened. And then the third paper, the, the other one that I, that I sent uh, to you all, looks at the problem from the Russian perspective and asks, why did Russia invade Ukraine? Um, and the argument that I make in that paper uh, is that it's not so much about geopolitics or not only about geopolitics, not about Russia and the West, but it's about the danger that, you, that a democratic Ukraine creates for Russia. Um, a Ukraine that is democratic, prosperous, and European sets an example to the Russian people that, uh, that Vladimir Putin does not like. And so I should say, not so much a threat to Russia, but a threat to Putin. Um, the dangers of the Putin regime, which has based its autocracy on the argument that the kind of democracy practice in the West will lead to catastrophe in Russia, as he argues it did in the 1990s, uh, after the collapse of, of the Soviet Union. Um, and more than, more than that, he argues it's a Western plot to weaken Russia and destabilize uh, the country. So what ties those three papers together um, and, and the theme of this lecture um, is, and, and what links this to phenomena across the world is this problem of legitimacy. And so just to cite a couple of other places, you look at what's going on in Syria and Iraq, where authority has broken down both externally, uh, based on external invasion and on internal uh, war across parts of, of uh, North Africa after the uh, Arab Spring, um, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Latin America, and so on, is this problem of legitimacy. Um, how is it that people accept the rule of government without being coerced? How is it that they just do what the government says even when the government can't coerce them? Because the government can't coerce everybody 
um, all of the time. Uh, some coercion is necessary, and how does that coercion come to be seen as, as legitimate? Typically, in, I would say in recent decades, that's been a very, those have been very theoretical questions. Right? It was political theorists who, who talked about the, the nature of legitimacy and the consent of the government and so on. And what I'm arguing is that today it's a very practical question. Um, it's, a, it's a question that's being played out in streets and in war zones um, around the world. Um, as I said, um, <coughs> dang, sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Um, right. In some countries, people are using leaders are using these democratic practices to legitimize rule that none of us would call democratic. Um, something Aristotle you know, warned about a couple thousand years ago. Um, but in other countries, of course, leaders are unable to find any basis to legitimate their rule at all. Um, they can't gain any kind of of, of uh, popular consent. And they even rely either have to rely completely on coercion. ISIS is probably a good example of that. Um, or they collapse, and we, of course we see state collapse all over the world these days. Shifting from the domestic level to the international level, um, we also have this problem of, 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 of legitimacy, which is um, the United States and Western Europe says to be legitimate, uh, to be a legitimate government, you have to be democratic. Countries like Russia and a lot of others, I would point to China as well, um, are denying that notion denying the legitimacy of a set of standards that the United States and Western Europe take for granted. Um, rejecting the US and Western Europe uh, as sources, as the arbiters of, of what's legitimate in the world and what is not. So you have this sort of larger scale global disagreement uh, about what counts uh, as acceptable government and about who is allowed to say so. There's some irony in that can offer that. All right, so let's talk about what happened in Ukraine now that I've given you the very, very big picture. Um, so go back to the Orange Revolution 2004. That picture looks a, a lot like the pictures from 2013, which is why I put it there. Lots of people in the streets. The only reason you would know that it's 2004, if you, if you knew the situation, is from these flags uh, that, that, that have slogans from 2004 on. Back uh, at that time, right, Viktor Yanukovych, who was the bad guy from 2014, um, tried to steal an election and was defeated by protests in the street in the streets. And everybody in the West said, and I was sort of one of these, but I was always a skeptic, said, hooray, democratic revolution. This is awesome. Um, we saw the United driven by people power um, and as sort of spontaneous democracy. In reality, of course, the level of organization that I talked about, stages being put up, uh, metros running on time, cell phone towers not being shut off, and so on and so forth, depended on a huge amount of collaboration by elites who were trying to uh, uh, eject um, the government. So they weren't, as, I don't think they were ever as people power driven as we thought. Um, but the bigger point is this. While we saw them as signs of dem popular democracy, and in some respects they were, they were also signs of extremely weak, of an extremely weak state. And that was something that we missed. Uh, retrospectively, whether we talk about 2004 or 2014, the ease with which those protester, protesters gathered and then ejected uh, uh, governments that just a few months previously had been seen as unassailable. Um, the ease with which they did that was, was amazing. Um, so here I've got a, a quote from the, the sociologist Max Weber. I'm gonna talk about legitimacy in the state. Gotta have some Weber in there. Um, Weber famously defined the state uh, as, as I think I put up there, yep, um, as an organization with a monopoly on the legitimate use of force within a given territory. And the argument that I, that I have made and that I would stress is that Ukraine, circa late 2013, early 2014, right up till now, um, was triply deficient in terms of Weber's definition of the state. It lacked a monopoly on violence. Lots of other people could, besides the state could put force in the streets. It lacked legitimacy in the use of violence because every time the regime tried to suppress protesters, more protesters came into the street because they were outraged that the government had used violence against protesters. And of course, uh, as we see now, the actual territory uh, scope, the territorial scope uh, of their ability uh, to, to uh, maintain order has more or less dissolved. And the key point, as I mentioned already, is that these protesters in, in the middle of Kiev had greater legitimacy than the state forces. 
right? It was not considered legitimate for the state to use forces against people who had encircled a main part of the capital city. Um, and, and this gets key to, to Weber's notion of, of the state, which is uh, for the state to work, the bureaucrats in the state, the operatives of the state, have to do what they're told. And yet, when push came to shove last year uh, in, in Kiev, a vast majority of state actors, and here I mean the organs of coercion, the police, the interior ministry, the army, um, could not be counted on to use force when they were told to do so by the legitimate authorities, or by, let's just say, the Yanukovych government, which presumably was the legitimate authorities. Ultimately, there were about 6,000 uh, members of a, of a specially chosen group known as Berkut, uh, sort of riot police. Uh, Yanukovych and his government understood he could count on them. But as events developed, especially after the snipers did their thing, um, it became quite clear that that was all that he could count on, was those 6,000. And, um, and that just wasn't enough to hold a country the size of Ukraine. So here, Luke and Wade, the University of Toronto, my, my buddy that I was there with. Uh, so they were the riot police, right, behind their signs. And this was an opportunity for tourists from America, college professors, um, to take pictures with the riot police. These guys were not going to shoot anybody. They were not going to beat anybody. They were freezing, right? They were freezing. Uh, protesters were giving them cups of coffee. They were sitting there, stomping their feet, trying to get warm. Graffiti was getting written on their shields, which, as you can tell, were just improvised sheets of plywood. These guys weren't going to hurt anybody, um, and they didn't. Um, so the fall of the Yanukovych regime, um, again, I would say, was as much about state collapse as it was about democracy. It's not to deny that it was about democracy. It's just to say that in almost any other country, um, and if you've ever gone to, say, Washington, D.C., when there's a World Bank meeting there, you can see how it is that you can deal with protests like this and make them go away like that, or at least contain them. Um, any other government could have dealt with it uh, quite easily. Uh, initially, uh, the protests were quite small, um, but they grew enormous once the, the uh, protest, once the police started uh, beating people, um, as I said. So again, it's this idea that the use of force by the state, that very notion of uh, the Weberian state, had the opposite effect of what it was intended, right? Didn't make protests go away, made it bigger. Um, it was simply wasn't considered acceptable for the state to use force, which is very, as I would say, very democratic, not so Weberian. Um, once things got, I mean, once those protesters were shot, and I showed the snipers earlier, um, it was 24 hours later, and the Yanukovych, Yanukovych government had fallen, and Yanukovych had to, had to flee the country. It happened fast. One of the key tactics of the anti-Yanukovych protesters, and this gets to the problem of the state having an expansive use of force, they would seize administrative buildings. You would seize a building, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, seize a building and occupy it, and then say, OK, come get us out because you knew that they couldn't come get you out, because if they did, they would have to beat you up, and if they beat you up, they would have another 20,000 people there the next day. All right. So it was just this question of if you could surprise them and seize a building, you had more or less won the tactical battle. So this is the inside of uh, the Kiev City Hall, which the protesters just took. Um, they were very orderly about it. They occupied the first couple of floors and left all the business offices upstairs untouched. Um, and you could, they, were, they were running their, their headquarters here. You can see there are people sleeping on the floor. Uh, people were resting. They actually had a soup kitchen going in part of it. Um, but once they were in there, it was very hard to push them out without violence. And the, the regime understood that if they used that violence, they would undermine their legitimacy even further. Um, and they did that first in Kiev, but more importantly, or I would say equally importantly, they did it out in the regions. So now, and this is uh, early 2014, You've got those 6,000 reliable troops. Maybe you can use them to do something in Kiev. But when all these other cities are having the same kind of things done, you simply overwhelm the ability of the state uh, to deploy the force where it can be used. The impossible for it to do anything about it. Also, that was true tactics. But as soon as the Yanukovych government fell and the interim government came to power, the forces opposed to the interim government, supported, of course, from Russia, used the exact same tactics. Uh, they occupied administrative buildings. They declared themselves to be in charge. They declared themselves to be independent of the new government in Kiev and said, what are you going to do about it? You probably can't get any forces here to, to stop me. And even if you could, right, your popularity would evaporate as soon as you did. So here we have uh, 
three men or four men, uh, uh, a bunch of men, not in any sort of normal military uniforms, uh, having occupied and taken control of the airport in Sevastopol in Ukraine uh, just after the, uh, the change of power in, uh, in 2014. And of course, Russia quickly took advantage of this. Um, Russia uh, it, it now appears in retrospect. Um, and there were some signs of this ahead of time that Russia had been preparing this for a long time. So now this unelected interim government with questionable legitimacy of its own, who had elected it, nobody, and basically zero forces at its disposal, was being challenged by well-organized special forces uh, from a much stronger neighboring state. All right, so this is, these are the irregulars that first appeared. Right, that's tw uh, February 28th, exactly a year ago. And by March 1st, you get this. Right? <coughs> this picture amuses me. Right? It's a person in balaclava wearing a balaclava, um, which gets into some interesting history of the Crimean War. Um, but we'll leave that for, for later. Um, so Crimea was seized by Russia without a shot being fired. And then, of course, they went after eastern Ukraine, which gets us where we are today. Um, now, back out to the bigger picture. I mean, that's essentially the story. Back out to the bigger picture. This state weakness is not a problem that is unique to Ukraine. We found in Iraq that once we, it was fairly easy, actually, to dislodge the regime of Saddam Hussein. Um, reconstructing some kind of functioning state there has turned out not to be so easy. Same thing in Afghanistan, the same thing all over Africa where states have, have, have crumbled for one reason or another. And there's a great paper, uh, it's a, probably a paper that's 10 or 12 years old now, but I don't think uh, gotten the attention that it deserves by James Pierre and David Layton, in which they argue um, that the main variable in, in explaining the outbreak of civil wars is not uh, ethnic uh, uh, diversity or, or ethnic tension, but in fact, state capacity. It says, basically, they argue states are challenged all the time. What varies, what differs, is whether or not they have any capacity to resist. Um, and while we, we, we could debate that, the point I want to make in the, in the case of Ukraine, but a lot of these other ones, is uh, states are challenged all the time. People protest in this country all the time. The government's pretty good um, at, at beating it back. Um, and a lot of other places, governments just topple like that. Although I want to stress, what's going on in Ukraine is really not a civil war. Right? It's an invasion. So let's talk about Russia a little bit more then. Um, Putin, as I stressed, has his own legitimacy problem. He started with elections. He was elected in 1999 in an election that was manipulated from the very get-go, very cleverly done. Um, so the elections now in, in, that we do see in Russia um, are fairly transparently rigged. And, and the, the rigging of Russian elections is transparent enough that they're no longer providing him with much legitimacy. Right? When everybody takes it for granted that the election's going to be stolen, nobody really buys it. Um, so, this, so then the, the question that Putin still has to struggle with is, how am I going to be legitimized? How is it that people are going to say, yeah, we're going to do what this guy says. We're not going to resist uh, because he should be here. And in that sense, what happened in Ukraine last year prevented uh, not only a threat, which I mentioned, the threat of showing that there's an alternative, but also an opportunity. If Russia can regain Ukraine, its historic territory, while humiliating the West, um, there will be this huge national uh, out outpour of support for history, uh, for, for Putin. And of course, Putin, as you may know, is fond of judo, right? So this was a great judo move. You take something that looks like a disaster for Russia and, and you turn it into a huge advantage. This is what he has done. So now, this is just this past week. They've now formed anti-Maidan organizations. Maidan is the Russian, uh, excuse me, the Ukrainian word for square, which refers to that area of Kiev where all the protests took place. So this says, I'm for Putin. They've got all these great uh, uh, flags. And he's now made it a point of Russian national pride right, to be against democratic overthrow of autocratic governments. That's good stuff. Right? He's no dumb. So this says, uh, uh, the Maidan, the protest in Kiev, is theater, and America is the director. And there's a picture of our, uh, Barack Obama, I think, rendered as Augusto Pinochet. I'm not sure who that's supposed to be. Yes. Uh, but it looks like it's Pinochet. Uh, so, so that's what Putin has been able um, to do with this, besides, of course, taking this territory. Let me... Uh, just go to this. This just shows us, I don't have too much to say about this, that just shows us where we're, we're kind of where we are now in the, in the uh, So Putin's fear points to a much broader global struggle right now, as I said. Um, 
this notion that Western style democracy is a universal standard. And he seems, at least for the time being, to be beating back against that, that notion. Um, so I want to talk in a little bit more detail about this, this kind of argument. Bring, go back to the global level. The Western position, right, we're all familiar with it, most of, it in this, most of us in this country take it for granted, is that democracy, liberal democracy, is a universal standard. Right? Uh, everybody ought to have it. It's a better way of running the world, a better way of running a country than autocracy or theocracy or something else. Um, there's a tension in this, in this argument, however, that some of these, what I would call revisionist powers um, or, or opposing powers like Russia and China um, exploit. And that is, domestically, the position of the West is that there should be free competition among various political actors, what we would call pluralism. But internationally, the West appears to be against pluralism. We appear to be saying there's a single rule and only a single way of doing things. And so the rhetoric that Russia has used, that China has used, that they've used together in an organization called the Shanghai Treaty Organization is to say, we want international democracy. And what they mean by, so they're invoking that standard at the international level to say what we want is international democracy, which means everybody gets to choose their own way of doing things. Right? Uh, and, and that's the struggle that's underway. Um, including, one, and one of the options that ought to be open in, in, in a plural international system, they would argue, is what they would call managed democracy, or things that have some elements of democracy, but are, of course, managed by a strong central government. Um, it's crucial to them that democracy is defined in the West not be the only standard of legitimate government. And of course, they have a lot to point to here, because really until World War II, there was not much global debate about, uh, uh, about notions of uh, non-interference in the <coughs> internal affairs of other countries. That was an international standard that had been accepted for many, many years. The West, of course, points to this newer standard of universal values. Right? Yes, it used to be we didn't interfere in each other's countries, but there's a universal standard now, which is why John McCain was on the Maidan, uh, 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 Under Secretary of State Victoria Newland was on the Maidan supporting the Ukrainian protesters because this presumably is, is, a, is a good thing. If you're in Russia, or if you're in China, or if you're in, in Iran, or Venezuela, or Cuba, or any number uh, of other places, it sounds not only like using democracy to change regimes, but using um, democracy to freeze international standards that keep those countries in a subordinate position. Or, or, or to actually uh, accomplish geopolitical goals. And this is the claim that Putin has made, and I don't doubt for a second that he believes it, which is that the Western focus on democracy is not merely intended to spread democracy, but is intended to subject countries like Russia um, to governments, like he would say the Yeltsin government of the 1990s, that the West could control, or that it at least would keep Russia weak. So, so they've turned this back in some respects. He's turned this back into a geopolitical argument. Um, so. What's going on in Ukraine now at the, geo, at the international level is not simply a conflict over territory or a geopolitical conflict. It's also a very, I would call it a, a postmodern conflict about discursive power for how is democracy going to be defined, what's it going to mean internationally, uh, what does law mean internationally, and so on. And of course, Russia's approach to truth in this conflict has been quintessentially postmodern um, in the sense that there's a million different truths, and mine is just as good as yours. So to conclude, back to the sex pistols, right? I don't know what I want, but I know how to get it. Um, undermining a weak state turns out to be pretty easy. Toppling a weak state turns out to be pretty easy. Um, once that state is broken, however, um, reconstituting effective authority is really hard, as we've seen around the world. And the question for Ukraine, but for a lot of other states as well, is whether um, they can rebuild uh, a strong state democratically. Um, Putin says you can't do it democratically. Putin says you can only do it with an iron fist. Um, Ukraine is trying to, 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 to prove that wrong, and of course is now trying to prove that wrong while somebody is very deliberately trying to make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, so Putin's argument that it can only be constructed through, through autocracy and that that, and that that fact justifies his autocratic rule. Um, but as I said, people like him and others have, have undermined the notion of democracy more subtly by using the basic ingredients of democracy, such as elections, to bolster autocracy. They've actually made democracy uh, um, look less attractive than it once did. To put it more broadly, and actually we see some signs of this in this country as well, democracy as a source of legitimacy is probably not as strong now as it once was because 
there have been these very deliberate as well as not so deliberate efforts uh, to undermine what it actually does and what it actually accomplishes. So I think in the big picture, looking out in the next you know, 10 or 20 years down the road, this problem of, of creating legitimacy for state power is going to persist. It's going to persist at the domestic level, but it's also going to persist at the level of the international um, community. Can the global community, we think about big problems, you know, global warming, uh, these sorts of things. Um, can, the global, can the international community build the authority, that is to say the capacity to act, um, to solve some of these kinds of problems? Uh, and it seems to me that, that for some of the same reasons that we're seeing at the domestic level, um, the ability to build that authority is, um, is, is weakening, and that agreement on the very basic rules of the game uh, seems to be uh, shrinking, uh, not growing over time. So that's my cheerful um, uh, rendering of what's going on in Ukraine and what it means for the rest of the world. Uh, I will be very happy uh, to take your questions. <laughs>